a year goes by and here's the big moment. It's like three in the morning. I'm, I'm living with Lisa and we're asleep three o'clock lights are out dark and the phone rings and um, it's never good when the phone rings at three in the morning. Uh, so I pick up and it's my friend Doug who did the drum part. And he's screaming in the phone, turn on MTV, turn on MTV. And I'm like, what, what, turn on MTV? Why? And, you know, my Lisa's hitting me like, get me, tell him you'll talk to him tomorrow. What's the big deal? You guys in your music, you know, like. <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> Some videos on, you gotta see it. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, he's, but Doug is flipping out. He's, he's beside himself. So I'm like, all oh, right. So I get out of bed and I turn on MTV and oh my God, there it is. There's the song. Insane. Insane. There's a video. There's the song. <laughs> like word for word, note for note. I was like, oh my God, is this, is this happening? You're listening to the Just Sayin podcast, offering conversations with experts that will educate, inform, and entertain. Here's your host of the Just Sayin podcast, Charlie Cornaccio. The Just Sayin podcast is brought to you by New Leaf Hypnosis Center. At New Leaf, you'll be working with mindset coach and hypnotist Anthony Serino to overcome mental roadblocks holding you back from achieving your goals. Using a science-based and client-centered approach, Anthony will help you design the life you deserve. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Just Saying Podcast. What happens when you have a childhood hero, someone that you've looked up to, you've admired, you wanted to be like, and then you find yourself in court having to sue your childhood hero? Well, today we're going to find out what that is like because we have a recording session guitarist who sued Ace Freely over a song that he wrote for Ace, and then Ace Freely used it without his permission. Gene Moore is the recording session guitarist who admired Ace Freely from a young childhood and then found himself having to sue him back in the late 80s. Gene, thanks for coming on the Just Saying podcast. Joining us from Mount Kisco, New York, let's get into the dynamics of what led to the lawsuit. The song that we're talking about is the first cut, and a single that was released from Freely's uh, second sighting album uh, that was released in 1988. The song is entitled Insane. And you guys kind of co-wrote that. So give us the background. Charlie, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Oops, wrong Gene <laughs> maybe Moore. <laughs> maybe you have the wrong guy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this, is, this is starting to ring a bell though yeah it's funny you say the whole thing about the guitar hero you know growing up um you know playing along to all the kiss albums and all those great songs you know that were that had so many great chords that you could wrap your head around as a beginner guitar player um songs like cold gin and and strutter um you know uh firehouse oh you know these are such great chords to learn on guitar so i was always you know very aware of ace freely growing up you know he was one of my heroes as much as you know Dwayne allman and jimmy page and um he was right there you know i, I love the way he played i love the way he phrased but you know as i got older i mean he was in the news a lot you know, for, for not good things. And, <laughs> you know, and as I got into music more, everybody seemed to have, you know, an Ace Freely story, you know, of some, in some level. So, um, you know, I was, I was aware, you know, he's a real, he's a real rock star, you know, he, he lives differently than the rest of us. I remember when I was a kid going to buy a motorcycle in, in, in the town that I, I grew up in, and even they had a story, you know, here I'm in buying a motorcycle. And the guy went, oh, yeah, Ace Freely was here, you know, a week ago. And he just tried one of these bikes and he flipped it over and, you know, it was the whole thing. And <laughs> like, yeah, you know. But That's then, my hero. <laughs> you know, then the big one for me was the day he drove the wrong way on the Bronx River Parkway. I don't know if you remember that. I do remember. I do remember that. Chase. Yeah with the cops right behind them going the wrong way. In that, went, that went into White Plains and uh, yeah. It ended up in uh, Valhalla. But, you know, I, I was very aware of all this stuff. So, um, okay, so flash forward, um, I'm a session guitar player. I'm, 
what, maybe 20, 25 years old, somewhere around there. So I played, you know, on other people's material. I just show up at whatever studio and, and play the songs. And uh, so this was just another gig. Uh, it was for a friend of mine named Bill Schurer, um, who's passed away. Um, but uh, I played on a lot of stuff for Bill. And this was just another date. Uh, they, he had some really good musicians on this date, too. I remember we had um, Clint DeGannon uh, oh, on drums. drums. Remember Clint? Yeah, sure I do, yeah. Uh, Tommy Mandel on keyboards. He went on to play with... Uh, I don't know if he played with Brian Adams, but he played on the, on the run to you album. You know, Tommy was all over that. So, you know, these were some really heavy hitters in this room. We finally took a break after a few hours and my friend Bill came out and said, Gene, I, I want you to meet somebody. And uh, he pulled me into the control room and there was Ace and he goes, Gene, this is Ace Freely. And I'd never met him. I'd never even seen him without his makeup. Oh, right. So, it was like, wow, this is Ace Freely. You know, it was just, it was a huge moment, you know, for me as a, as a guitarist, you know, meeting him in person and realizing he's been producing me the whole day. I didn't even know it, you know. Oh, man. He's like, man, this guy sucks. Let me take this fader. <laughs> so um, so he, uh, when I went back to finish my, I guess I was going back to do my solos now. And just as a goof, I started playing all the old Kiss songs, you know, just to, show him that I didn't show some respect or something that I knew, you know, how he voiced all these chords and stuff like that. I, I thought it would be a cool moment, but I guess he was just like, Oh, you know, cause he was pretty just, just fresh out of kiss. Oh yeah. He just started his solo career. Right. And I don't, you know, from what I've read that didn't end well. So mm. maybe playing that was not the smartest idea, but anyway, um, so after the session was over, I go in the control room. We're listening to some of the uh, mixes back. And, and he's, he was really nice. He said, Gene, you know, I really liked your guitar playing. Um, he goes, um, maybe you want to jam sometime. I'm like, sure, you know, any time. You know, like I'm a, I'm a you know, starving musician. Name your time. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, you know, pretty soon after that, um, he, he, we talked on the phone, he gave me his address. So, you know, that was a pretty cool moment. I'm pulling into, you know, Ace Freely's driveway, you know, it's like the garage was open and all of his road cases were in there and it had like, you know, Kiss 12, Ace, you know, three, the big road cases, you know, the giant, you know, probably had like four or five cabinets in it. Right. And it, that kind of gave me a thrill. It's like, so, you know, I knock on the door and he comes to the door and, you know, at that age, I'm, I'm just trying to be cool. I don't want to scare him away. You know, I'm just trying to be like, Hey, what's up? You know, like, and he's, and he was real friendly. He's like, come in. I'm, um, you know, like having a heart attack. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm in Ace Freely's house right now. You know, this isn't happening. So, uh, but he was, he was totally cool. It wasn't like I walk into, you know, this big party going on and right, yeah. this whole rock star thing. It wasn't that. It was, you know, just come on in, let's hang and talk and play. And uh, so I remember we, didn't, we went into like a music room he had and he had a bunch of guitars and amps. And um, he was playing through an amp, you know, like just, you know, musician to musician. Check this out, you know. Right. What do you think of this head? What do you think of this sound, you know? How about these pedals? So, uh, you know, it's like we're, you know, just talking about our tackle boxes, you know, like he played me a cassette of a couple of like licks he was working on. And uh, he said, you know, maybe you want to write something together sometime. And I was like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. You know, so uh, he gave me a cassette. It had about three songs on it. I remember. And it was just, you know, he pressed record on a, you know, on a little cassette player and just played guitar, you know, live. You know, I, I was a songwriter at that time. I was, I was used to writing. I was used to recording. And um, one of the songs just clicked instantly, you know, like I was like, whoa, there's a lyric. Oh, there's a line, you know, like, wow. Yeah, yeah. And it started actually on the ride home from his house. You know, that's when you know you got something, you know, it just you know how it is. It just comes at you. You can't write fast enough. You can't, yeah, you know, right, right. you're writing it as fast as you can because it's just coming in like a, like a, a flood. I remember I finished it that night and um, I called my buddy Doug Brown uh, and I said, look, I had this song, you know, believe it or not, I wrote this for Ace Freely and 
um, uh, we're kind of writing this thing together and can you help me, you know, program a drum part for it? I want to give them back, you know, a fully produced version of this thing. I have words, I have lyrics, I have a melody, I have chords. I sketched the whole thing out front to back. I even but, did a solo. But he, he only gave you a couple of chords, right? Is he that, did, yeah. It was so like, that was the genesis of it? you know the song it was just yeah this quick little lick in there he called it quick lick i remember that was the name of the song on the tape i just remembered that okay quick lick that was it so I got together with Doug and Doug uh, programmed the drums on a DMX drum machine. Wow. <laughs> Talk about old school. I yeah. wonder if that's where DMX got his name. Wow, I never thought of that. The rapper, DMX. Yeah, sure, right. Yeah. He lives right nearby, actually. Nearby you? Yeah, so many people in the music business live right like a mile from me. It's so weird. Warren Haynes. Yeah. He's like a mile away. It's a whole other story. Uh -huh. uh, Rob Thomas. Yeah. Right here, I had a long chat with him too. Uh, DMX never met him, but I know he lives nearby. But anyway, um, so we finished the the drum part and um, you know laid down the the guitar parts and the chords and the, and the bass and and then I I tried to sing it, um, thinking of Ace like how would he mm -hmm. sing this? You know what kind of vibe would it be and what kind of notes can he hit and that kind of thing. Not that I had some big range, but I just didn't want to, you know, sing something out of his range that wouldn't make sense. Laid a solo down, put it back on a uh, cassette <laughs> and um, called him up and said, OK, you know, I, I think I got something. He goes, all right, come on back over. Let's see what you got. So I go back over and he puts the cassette in his big stereo system in his living room and cranks it up and I'm sweating bullets. I'm just like, oh, my God, is this really happening? You know? I didn't know what to make of his reaction because he was like, yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> just, that's it. I'm no like, emotion. No. Not great. <laughs> um, you know, he goes, yeah, it's okay. He goes, uh, yeah, let's, let's jam a little bit. And so we, we played a little bit more. And uh, you know, he's, he was just a very nice cat. He was like, you want to shoot some pool? Wow. Like, yeah, sure. So, you know, I'm shooting pool. Then I'm just, I'm just trying to keep up. You know, he's my, he's my guitar hero. I'm just like, yeah. Just don't say anything stupid, you know. <laughs> um, I think I was over there like two more times. Where I remember buying him lunch and bringing it over. And, uh, and I also went back over with my wife, Lisa, my girlfriend at the time. He was showing us some stuff he was doing on uh, a computer, a, you know, a personal computer. And that time it was a little ahead of its time. He was doing some animation stuff. And Wow. So that was pretty this, cool. Well, this was uh, when, like 88, 87? Way earlier, 86, probably, somewhere 80, around 86. there. 86, okay. Yeah. 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 That was about it. And I think like a year went by. I hadn't had any communication with him. Mm -hmm. I think I reached out to him a couple of times because I had another, another song that came to me, and I recorded that one, and I wanted to give it to him. So I was trying to reach him. But – from what I heard, he was um, moving around a lot and my number wasn't good for him anymore. And, um, and I was kind of moving around. So he was having trouble getting in touch with me if he even tried. I don't know. But a year goes by and here's the big moment. Now that I've put everybody to sleep. Um, it's like three in the morning. I'm, I'm living with Lisa and we're asleep. Three o'clock, lights are out, dark. And the phone rings, and um, it's never good when the phone rings at three in the morning. Uh, so I pick up, and it's my friend Doug who did the drum part. And he's screaming in the phone, turn on MTV, turn on MTV. And I'm like, what, what, turn on MTV, why? And, you know, my lease is hitting me, like, get, tell him you'll talk to him tomorrow. What's the big deal? You guys in your music, you know, like, <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> Some videos on, you gotta see it. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, he's, but Doug is flipping out. He's, he's beside himself. So I'm like, oh, all right. So I get out of bed and I turn on MTV and, oh my God, there it is. There's the song. Insane. Insane. There's a video. There's the song. <laughs> Like word for word, note for note. I was like, 
oh my God, is this, is this happening? Woof. Okay. So, uh, you know, didn't sleep the rest of the night, obviously. Yeah. And um, get up the next day and I start, you know, trying to figure this thing out, trying to find Ace, trying to figure, you know, what, what do I do? You know, what, do I have any contract to sign or, you know, like, I'm seeing this thing as like saving my life as a musician, you know, I'm just, I'm scraping by, I'm yeah. always broke. And, you know, you always hear about the big break, you know, that comes and I thought, wow, this is my break, you know, this, this could change my life. You know? Well, you, you were kind of hot at that moment in time. Wasn't that around the time of the, the Go Giants Go? Uh, a little before it. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you were, you were hitting, you were hitting something in the vortex that was, <laughs> that was like, oh, this is your moment. And for those huh. of you, uh, what I'm referring to is, uh, Gene, you probably could tell it better than I can, but you, uh, when the Giants were going for their Super Bowl run, you uh, wrote a song off, uh, take off of Go Johnny Go to Go Giants Go. Yeah. And you actually played it at Giants Stadium. Yes, I did. Yeah. And that got airplay and everything. And it was, wasn't it played in the stadium as well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a big deal for 15 minutes, you know, but it was, it was a pretty cool ride to be on. I, you know, can't imagine, you know, being a real artist and that's your life. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. brief, but man, it was wild. You know, everybody wanted to know you. It was everybody wanted strange. you. Everybody yeah, wanted you to play it. Yeah. Yeah. But So, so there you were and you know, like, you know, everything was kind of hitting it was almost like, this is my time. So I could see where you could say, I just wrote a song for him. I just saw it on MTV, word for word, note for note. This is it. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's gone. start looking for a house. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I just, I, I, you know, it, it was just crazy to, to, to think where this could go. And I was so excited about it. But, you know, my next step was to try to, you know, get back in touch with Ace. And I couldn't, and I couldn't find him. And um, I, I had a lawyer at the time because, you know, we had this band called Restless who was, you know, trying to get a record deal. And so this was our lawyer at the time. I won't mention him, but, um, you know, I started with him and to see what he could come up with and who he could connect me with at the record company. We knew it was Megaforce Records. That's what the, uh, the record company was at the time. But I, I couldn't get anywhere. I couldn't reach anybody. You know, <laughs> nobody's available for comment. Who are you, Gene Moore? Click. <laughs> so I started to think, wow, you know, you hear all these things about the music business. Here we go. You know, wow, I'm I'm in it now. Right. So then, uh, a, a long time after that, I was at my in-laws' house, and the phone rang, and it was Ace. He called me at my in-laws house. I don't know how he found the number. He said, uh, hey, you know, the record company really loves that song and uh, we're gonna release it as the, the single, you know, off this new uh, CD that's coming out. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, so Ace, you know, what do I do? What's the, what's the move? And he goes, well, um, I'm playing at um, uh, the Meadowlands uh, tomorrow night. I'm warming up for Iron Maiden. He goes, why don't you come down and then we'll talk about it. You stay after the show, come backstage. I'll leave some passes for you, you know, at the front gate. Just, you know, come on down and then we'll, they'll figure this out. So um, I went down with Lisa. Went to that, went to little gate he told me to go to and said, I have two tickets waiting for me for Ace Freely. And, she, and they go, oh yeah, here you go. I'm like, wow, okay, we're in. So we went into the, to, you know, the, the stadium and watched Ace perform and got to hear him do insane that was a big moment for me you know sitting there looking around like <laughs> pe watching people singing along like that was oh, really cool you know like yeah hmm, i wrote that <laughs> <laughs> like sure you did <laughs> but uh you know the iron maiden crowd is a you know that's a that in those days it was a hardcore crowd i mean you know the right. fact that I had a shirt on was unusual, you know. <laughs> so here I brought, you know, I brought my date to the Iron Maiden concert. That was pretty funny. So Elisa was, you know, good sport about it. And we, uh, they, I don't know if you remember, Iron Maiden used to have a robot called Eddie. 
this giant robot would come out. Yes. On stage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so her and I watched the whole show. You know, we're waiting until the end, and and now you know, I don't really know who Iron Maiden is. I mean, obviously I know the name, but yeah. I don't. I don't have any of their albums. I never played any of it, so I'm just not familiar with the band at all. You know, but you know, I, I'm watching it. They're you know obviously amazing. The lead singer is unbelievable. Um. So okay. So after the concert's over, I show my passes to the you know to get backstage. We go backstage. Lisa and I are hanging out with Iron Maiden. I don't know who they are. I'm the, I'm the last guy that should be back here right now. I kept thinking like all the people that would kill, you know, to be backstage with Iron Maiden right now. And I didn't even know who they are. This is, this is like so beyond wrong, but you know, I'm just waiting for ACE. I'm waiting to, you know, sign whatever contracts we need to sign or talk about what we need to talk about. Right. But he never shows. What? So I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And, you know, Iron Maiden's looking at Lisa and I like, what are you guys doing here? You know? And so we're just kind of, you know, keeping in a corner until we find <laughs> Ace, you know, like, please God, you know, let him show up. And so I asked one of the security guys, is Ace coming? And, and he goes, no, nah, Ace is gone. I'm like, oh no. He goes, yeah, I, I, I think, he, I, I'm thinking this out loud. I think him and his wife had split and that night she came to the show and I think they kind of reconciled and he left with her. I think that's what the guy told me, his wife. Oh, okay. Her name now. She came back and they kind of left together. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay. So we went home and, uh, you know, here we go. You know, once again, I'm trying to get in touch with them. I can't, I get, none of the numbers are working. So that went on for a really long time. A friend of mine is a lawyer and he agreed to kind of take this on and see if we could, you know, recoup whatever was supposed to come to me. So at that point, you just decided that rather than trying to get with him and, and finally meet with him and see what the next stage of this thing was, you decided to go the, the litigation route? It was a long time. It oh. was probably two years. Oh, you hadn't heard from him again? And, no. Oh. And yeah. so you, but you probably followed the album that came out and song. I did. And I saw it came out on another album. There was an album called 12 Picks. It was on that as well. So, it, you know, it just, I, I. Did you have a credit? Yes. Yeah. My name was on the song, on the record. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's good. I say record. Yeah, uh, right. It was well, a record was. at the it time. It was records at the time. But, um, so, but, but the, you never received a dime. Not up to that point, no. Mm. So the part, I guess the part that I wrestled with, and this is like, I don't know if you and I have even ever talked about this, but I thought that Ace would have kind of taken me under his wing. No. I, I thought he would have said, you know, this guy plays, he sings, knows how to produce you know, be a good guy for me to have in my camp, you know, he just wrote, you know, the single to my next CD. I wonder what else he's got up his sleeve, you know, what, right. what other material he could, he could write for me, you know, yeah. what could we do together if we did this for a year or two, you know, what could we come up with? You know, I just thought that's the way it was going to go. He would kind of have me back over his house and say, all right, we need to fill out these contracts we need to get you a BMI, ASCAP deal, you know, whatever we got to do, get some money flowing. You know, he knows the business, you know, like I don't know anything at this stage. Yeah. I know show up with my guitar, play a session, get my $50 and go home. You know, that was, that was what I knew. <laughs> you know, I just assumed that's the way it was going to go that I would even maybe go on the road with him. Mm. You know, maybe we'd tour together, but you know, then I found out, you know, Todd Howard. <laughs> <laughs> was his guitar player is like tremendous yeah so uh, he wouldn't need me for that but you know maybe a second guitarist i don't know right or just you know. a, just a, a song collaborator you know yeah if nothing but, else i had I, other material I, I got a, i got a feel for you in the sense that here's your longtime hero a guy you really admired now you're sort of on the in the inner circle um, he gives you a kudo by taking your song and using it. Yeah. And so you're thinking to yourself, not only is he my hero and I got to meet him, but now we're getting intimate 
in, in the music world somewhat and what this could lead to. And I know in everybody's minds, you know, you start thinking, oh, it could then lead to this and then lead to that. And you start charting your whole future and then you get your legs cut out from under you. That had to be devastating for you yeah, it was, as a fan. it was really rough. Yeah, it was really rough. I, I just assumed he'd see me as kind of the golden goose or something, you know, like mm-hmm. he'd needed a top song for a, a long time. And I gave him one. I just handed it to him first shot, you know, like, yeah. Imagine if we worked together, you know, like on a regular basis, what we could have come up with. I just, I didn't even know him. I just took a shot at this, you know, and, yeah. but imagine if we really dug into it, him and I together, what we could have done. Right. So, I mean, that, that just surprised me, but yeah. So now you're in a position where you, you have to sue your childhood hero Yeah. and you got to get a lawyer, but lawyers are, are expensive. Do it. Yeah. Do you, I guess you need a specialized lawyer, right? You can't just go to any lawyer. Got to be someone. Well, the guy that did the lawsuit for me was a real estate lawyer. Oh, wow. I had an entertainment lawyer on retainer for restless. Um, yeah. For restless. Yeah. But, <clears throat> he couldn't make anything happen. So this friend of mine had some ideas of how to get around some of the red tape and go right directly to the record company and, and get in it. You know, all we're trying to do is get an accounting yeah. of whatever money was due to me. If it was zero, it's zero, but you know, it would be nice to know. Let's make this legit. You know, yeah. this song has showed up on three, maybe even four records now, live DVDs, who knows what else, you know? So can we just do something? Wouldn't you pay this kid something just to get him out of your life? <laughs> <laughs> and so what was the end result? Was the end result that you finally got your due? Or? You know, we got something, you know, because I didn't, I didn't pay for my lawyer. You know, the, the, he, he gets it on commission. You know, he takes the commission of whatever settlement we got. And, um, and you know, it just felt crappy. The whole thing just felt crappy to have to do that to ace. Yeah, right. And I still feel that way, you know, even after all these years, I just, I just wish we could talk about it and I could maybe tell him my side of it and he could tell me his or whatever. And, you know, especially now I, I've been in the music business for a long time. <laughs> and I know, you know, there's, there's no money, you know, it's like, right. you know, maybe he, you know, this is just how it rolled in those days. I don't know, but, it was just a kind of a weird thing to have to go through. So, so you, you did resolve it. You are or were getting royalty checks. Are you still getting any royalty checks? Yeah, I get a dollar twenty-five a, a quarter, I think, something like that. <laughs> Wonder why I'm a website designer. A dollar twenty-five a quarter. <laughs> yeah, I open the statement. It's this big thick packet of papers and I have to open the whole thing and it's such a waste. <laughs> And I have to deposit a dollar twenty-five. I feel like Jerry Seinfeld when he <laughs> gets the uh, super terrific happy hour checks. <laughs> it's oh. like, uh, honey, check is in the mail today. Freely came out with a book called No Regrets. Yeah, I read it. Yeah. You read it? Yeah. Any reference to you in there? No, thank God. It, it <laughs> came close because it was kind of cr- chronological. Right. So, uh, and it got to the point where the saying was coming out and I'm sweating. I'm like, Oh no, you know, what's he going to say? Oh, speaking of which, that's another thing that I found a little weird. I wasn't invited to the video shoot. Oh. I mean, the guy that co-wrote the song, don't you have to invite him to the video shoot? You would and that think. was a fun yeah. video shoot. Come on. Did yeah, you see it? yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Hey now. <laughs> <laughs> hey now. So anyway, um, yeah. yeah, but, um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, talk about full circle. This is my, this is how I'm going to wrap up this whole thing for you. Okay. Lisa, my wife, uh, goes to a hairdresser in Mount Kisco and, um, he's work. This guy's, uh, his name is Derek. And he always works on her hair and, you know, he's her colorist and he cuts her hair and does all that stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a big deal in my house. Three sure. girls and all Three that. Girls, right. you know? So I don't know how it came up, but she ended up talking to him about music and, and he mentioned something like 
he mentioned something about Ace Freely. <laughs> And Lisa said, I got, oh. good story. <laughs> goes, I got a good story for you. So she tells Derek the story of insane. And he goes, you're not going to believe this, but I tour with Ace. I'm his guitarist. What? Yeah. Derek the guy cutting is, her hair? Yeah. He's Ace's guitar player. He goes what? on tour with Ace. Like, he goes, Ace. <laughs> I performed insane like a million times. Oh, like you needed to hear that. <laughs> oh, oh man. Uh, that's crazy so what a crazy small world coming all the way back to that isn't that yeah. nuts it, you know it's interesting i think it was in early 2000s um ace really sued a uh one of those nostalgia companies um for like trademark and infringement Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, they were called Resaurus or something like that. They were selling replicas of Ace Freely's Les Paul. Oh. And they were doing it like they had a, a deal with Gibson, but they were doing it without his permission. Wow. And he sued them. And it's almost like, yeah, now you know how it feels. <laughs> 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 when, you, you're doing something, when somebody's doing something oh, without no. your permission, Man. right? Oh, man, that's that. I tell you something, Charlie. I wish I read his book, you know, before I met him because I knew nothing about him. I didn't know how he was wired, how he rolled. Yeah. But after reading the book, I just I feel like I, I know him a lot better now. You haven't really been playing guitar these days, right? I mean, which is a I, crime, a crime in itself. For those of you who have never heard Gene play. Uh, full disclosure, we played in a band together for 20, well, how long was that? For about me, 20. For, for me, it was yeah. about 22 years or something yeah. like that. And uh, we played clubs and weddings and, and all that stuff back in our early, my my 20s, or yeah. thir into 30s and, and whatever. And and Gene was by far the best guitarist I've ever played with. And you he, he is. Nice now you, I mean, you from the time I first met you, you were, you know, at 14, I think it was, and you were playing Brian May stuff, like <laughs> note for note, it just so clean. For the fact that you're not playing now, and I've always said this, whenever you're not playing, that's a crime, because oh. you have such a gift for it. You're doing other things, uh, web creation and design, is that correct? Yeah, um, I mean, I was a music composer up until 1996. Mm -hmm. around there so I was a full-time musician I was gigging I was writing I wrote for jingle houses in New York City yeah, right. um, I was a staff writer at Radio Band of America that was that was a really big music house back in that day with Harley Flom was was the owner you know we were competing you know we had some major campaigns it it was a you know an interesting life uh, you know, to be a musician and have to go back to the drawing board with every song and soundtrack. It was a different thing every day. It was, you know, it's very unpredictable, you know, mm, what yeah. you're going to be faced with. Right. And the timing was really difficult. BMW goes to Europe and shoots these unbelievable ads with huge crews and directors and and they book advertising time for Monday morning and Sunday night. They go, oh, my God, we don't have music. You know, it was like <laughs> right. that. And, you know, your beeper goes off and it's like, oh, my God, okay. You're up all night, you know, writing something for this so they can get the thing on the air at 8 o'clock in the morning. And so it was, it was stressful. And, and a lot of times it really conflicted with my life. And, you know, I've got two young children now and, and a marriage I'm trying to keep together. And it's just like it's it's tricky, you know, being a, yeah. a jingle writer. I know it sounds a little goofy, but it was a great living, but a lot of work, a lot of stress, a lot of stress, a lot I'm of sure. rejection. Yeah. You used used to, to write me, 20 things before one gets chosen, you know, you used to tell me stories of when, you know, at this time there was no internet, there was no digital no. transfer. And yeah. so you would drive into the city and you would play your thing. And yeah. they would like it, but they'd be like, no, no, you know, we got to change this, change that. Yeah. And we got to have it by this time. You'd have to battle the traffic, drive back to Westchester County, re-record it, and drive back down again. Yeah. Crazy. It was crazy. It was exciting. It felt amazing. <laughs> when it worked. I'm, I'm yeah. doing what I love to do for a living. It, it was really exhilarating. Yeah, yeah. 
but yeah, no, after no. a period of time, it just was like, wow, this is really getting hard. Um, and by some miracle, uh, I, I had written a piece of music and I had to go to a, a graphic design company. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called, called North New Light, New Light Productions or something like that. Uh -huh. So I had to go there with a piece of music. I'm presenting it to a client. They're laying it up, you know, on film to whatever I was doing. And I was kind of wandering around looking in the doors of the guys doing the animations there. They did video editing, they did graphic design. And one of the guys was doing some, something in Photoshop. And I don't know what happened to me, but I had to know how that all worked. <laughs> and I feel like my life changed that day. The guy that I met, his name is Gene Levine. Yeah. And he also had passed away uh, yeah. years ago. But this dude, I tell you, he just took my hand. He goes, here, here's a copy of Photoshop. <laughs> and here's how to use it. And uh, I started reading books on website design. And it was like this weird, uh, like I've done it my whole life kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. It was the most natural thing. And like within a year, I was like a legitimate website designer my clients you know started with individuals mm -hmm. you know as artists songwriters anybody that needed a website but all of a sudden now i'm working for pepsi right pepsi yeah. cola I'm, I'm designing three of their internal websites wow um so it, it just was like meant to be yeah. yeah and i just kind of you know left the music world at that point yeah. It was much more predictable. I, I loved that I wasn't competing anymore. Mm -hmm. When I'm hired to do something, I do it and I get paid for it. Wow, there's no competition. There's no rejection. And the timing was better. I love working nine to five. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> that oh, worked yeah. really good for me. Yeah, Clients sure. didn't work on the weekends back in those days. Well, that's, yeah, um, I think that's what happens. You know, once you get into uh, a family dynamic, yeah, you know, and you start having children, and you start realizing, wow, you know, I got to make sure that they have a roof over their heads and they've got stability. And yeah, this is a very unstable industry, and this one is more stable. And yep. you know, you're a creative guy by nature, so I could see how you could fall into that. It's not a far stretch for you, no. because you have creative tendencies. So that that works in your favor, and the fact that you were extremely passionate about it, I think you know, when yeah. when you're when you're passionate about something. At you in particular, I know that, you know, you, you're like a hundred percent at it, you know? So I still love it to this day. I love designing websites. Yeah. It's a weird thing. It's, it's very musical in a way. Like it's, it's like a composition. You, mm. you start at the top and you work down and it all has to work together. It has to have a consistency. Um, there's branding, you know, there's all this stuff that goes into it. Right. And it's just, it's just such a natural fit for me. I've always been good at it. And I still love to do it. Man. It's the weirdest thing after all this time. Hey. Every job, I can't wait to get started at it, you know? It's so crazy, right? <laughs> and you've been doing but, it for how long? God, since 95. What's that? 25 years. Yeah, 25 years. Oof. Wow. Good for, good for you. And it's, it's better than ever now with the tools that I have now. I, you know, my God, I wish I had them back then. Like oh, with anything, don't, yeah, don't we all, yeah. God, imagine, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's really cool. And designing for all the different types of devices now, that's really super challenging. Yeah. You know, for phones and tablets. That's and right. Every yeah. type of brand and manufacturer, Android versus Apple. There's just like a million mm -hmm. permutations. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to be able to make one website that works perfectly on all those, I don't know, gives me a thrill. Yeah. <laughs> when you're driving in your car and you're listening to music or whatever, maybe not listening to anything, do um, melodies or um, songs come into your head that you're like, oh, I got to write this down? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sad about that. It no, doesn't huh? happen to me anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It used to all the time. It used to yeah. come to me all the time. But, right. um, but I, I, I don't want you to be sad about this. I, I still play guitar, every, you know, just about every day. Do you? I've been slacking off lately. Yeah, just, I got a just, really nice setup in my office. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I plug my iPhone into a mixing board and I have a Marshall cabinet with a, I put, you know, a Fender Twin reverb. Remember that Fender Twin sure. that I used to play in the band with? Yeah. I took the guts out of it and I made a head 
you know, so it looks like a, <laughs> you ever seen a basement head? Yeah. It yeah. looks like that on top of a Marshall cabinet. It's like, it doesn't belong, but you know, it's this beautiful combination. I, I love, you know, tinkering with pedals and all that. And right. yeah. so I'm still chasing my, my ultimate tone, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to like a young guy coming up who was maybe you when you were 25? Hmm. Well, um, there's always so much you can control in life. And you do the best you can. And I don't know if I would have done this any differently. Something I would recommend is running it by someone who is, you know, like a mentor to you, someone that knows business a little bit. One of the reasons I bring this up, Robeson Oil. Oh, boy. I know this story, but go ahead. Yeah. So I wrote the Robeson Oil jingle, yes. which is in Westchester County. and. I signed a piece of paper that said that, you know, here's what you're making and that's it. And we own this from now on. Mm -hmm. And this is what you're going to get. And don't ever ask us for another dime because we can use this for whatever we want. And at that time, that seemed like a good deal to me. Yeah. Because I just, I didn't understand business. I, I didn't have any money. This is a bird in the hand. Of course right. I'm going to sign it. This is a job. Right. It's a song. I'm I'm I'd be able to write a song. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. And wow, is that a mistake? That thing's been on the air for 25 years, maybe more. 30, 30 years. That thing is still going. Yeah. And they put the slogan on all of their trucks. You've, You've got, got a friend, friend at Robeson. Robeson. I wrote that. I yeah. wrote that slogan. But if I before signing that contract. I might have run it by, you know, someone in my family that understood law or a friend. And, and maybe they would have said, you know, instead of the flat fee, you know, consider like a yearly percentage or something mm -hmm. or, or, you know, a per play, like five cents a play or something or, like or, that. Yeah, you know, a licensing fee. Yeah. You know, yeah. Right. But who would have thought? No, no, because, you know. That, you know, I thought that what's this going to run for six months? Yeah, that it's a, was, it's that was a, pretty typical. You know, it's a local company, a local oil company. Yeah, right. It's not that right. big, and you're thinking to yourself, "Wow, I'm making, I'm making money. They like my stuff." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's a good day. Right. I yeah. remember being very happy that day that I signed that contract. Yeah. If I could warn anybody, it's just you know, get a second opinion of someone that knows this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. run it by somebody. I didn't have anybody to run it by at the time. Yeah. But I, I, you know, I would recommend that. Gene, thanks so much for sharing your story. Yeah, my it, brother. It was great to catch up with you. Every time we're together and we're talking, all these great memories just keep flooding through of our time together. So we um, could do 20 of these, Charlie. I, tell uh, you, <laughs> stuff that I, don't, know. I don't know that we want to do 20, but yeah, um, yeah there but, was some, some good stories. Yeah. Thank well, you, bro. Good. No, thank you. Nice. Great seeing you. Great to see you. All right. Take care. Thanks, Charlie. Anyway, that will do it for this edition of the Just Saying Podcast. Make sure to download or order my book, How I Met My Mother and Four Brothers I Never Knew I Had. And you can get that through Barnes & Noble uh, or wherever you download your books. That will do it for this edition. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and be kind. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Just Sayin' Podcast. 